lecture number four, part one. In today's lecture, we look into the theatrical production uh, in the 18th century. Specifically, we focus on the theatrical production of She Stoops to Conquer by Goldsmith. There were two um, uh, prominent literary figures that dominated the theatrical production, especially in the last quarter of the 18th century. Goldsmith and Sheridan. Goldsmith was mostly associated with the Covent Garden Theatre. Sheridan was associated with the Drury Lane Theatre. Both playwrights contributed to the uh, to the theatrical production by adding new uh, direction conventions and acting conventions that were new to the theatrical production at that time. Uh, as I said, when we talk about Goldsmith's uh, theatrical production, we mainly talk about the Covent Garden Theatre, which was built um, in the 1780s, and it was uh, renovated and expanded by Goldsmith. When, um, b before we proceed into the Covent Garden Theatre, um, there were uh, a variety of theatres at that time, and they seeped some of their conventions and the traditions into the Covent Garden Theatre. However, their contribution uh, was minimal uh, compared to how well respected this playhouse was. Now, the Covent Garden Theatre was um, uh, regarded as one of the uh, biggest theatres in the European continent at that time, the proscenium of it, uh, by the way, uh, it is called the proscenium uh, uh, theatre because the proscenium arch of it was about 43 feet wide, so it was uh, considerably um, large compared to the other theatres uh, at that time. It's there was also a uh, and by uh, the proscenium uh, is the part of the stage that is before the curtain. The fourth stage is the part of the stage that is almost um, uh, in touch with uh, the auditorium, which is the, uh, the, the place where uh, the audience um, sits. Now, we spoke of uh, a variety of inventions and improvements that were added to the theatrical production, but mainly we, when we speak about the proscenium, uh, we speak of a, um, the insertion of pictures of inserts of tableau to make the scenes as uh, realistic as possible. They wanted I mean the playwrights, their plays to be um, as realistic and plausible to their audience because the physical context of, of, the, of the play is really important uh, and contributive to the, uh, to the, uh, to the whole uh, atmosphere uh, of the play. Now, in She Stoops to Conquer, um, Goldsmith faced a challenge. Why? Because the scene does not really, uh, does not only have to look like, uh, uh, to look realistic and plausible to the audience, but it has to, uh, to change um, according to the perspective from which it is looked at. We saw that at the beginning of this play in uh, Act 1, especially Scene 1, we see a conflicting, contradicting views between Mr. Hardcastle and Mrs. Hardcastle. Mood, uh, spirit, and taste, whereas Mrs. Hardcastle doesn't see the same thing. Uh, she uh, thinks that uh, her place needs uh, renovations, uh, needs to be revamped and modernized as far as the furniture goes. So uh, at the very beginning, we see the conflicting views on one place, but then comes um, the need to make. Uh, 
the 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 same scene not only uh, an old fashioned or maybe a dilapidated building but also it has to uh, to look like um, a plausible inn that is uh, when you look at the scene, it is convincing that it is an inn, uh, and uh, th this is this is important because Marlowe is going to be uh, to mistake Mr. Hardcastle's mansion for an inn. So here uh, uh, comes the challenge: how we can make, or how he uh, could make one a place to look like a shabby inn to look like a dilapidated building and to look like an old fashioned uh, classic uh, classic mansion uh, if perceived from different characters point of view we can literally say that goldsmith wanted the setting for the, for for she stoops to kanka to look like a chameleon um, that reptilian animal that changes color according to the environment in which it is at okay so uh, the presence of the presenium on the fourth stage um, helped with the creating scenic groupings um, uh, it is the situation in which um, you have uh, two characters that are having a dialogue but from the other side of the theater you can see uh, uh, other characters not necessarily conversing but uh, they are uh, having a moment from which we can infer um, uh, something about them or about their relationship now the, pres the presence of the fourth stage really helped with the revelation of characters feelings and emotions feelings emotions and also thoughts why because a character can uh, speak to the audience how and she stoops to kanka specifically we have two dramatic um, techniques that are pertinent to the construction of the plot and in making the characters relevant to the audience from uh, one side we have the dramatic technique of solace uh, when a character steps forwards um, on the forest stage and directs his his comments feelings thoughts to the audience to the auditorium um, and this creates this bond between the actor or the uh, or the character and the the spectators um, so this is the dramatic technique of solace. From the other hand, we have um, the dramatic technique of asides. And uh, by asides, we mean, like, imagine the situation. We have two characters. They are conversing. They are exchanging uh, a dialogue. Um, and one of them has a, a conflicting or a different view on the main uh, dialogue that is going on between... Um, between him or her and the other character. Now, um, she or he confides in the in the audience. Like I do not, um, I have a different feeling about the the current dialogue. So um, he or she confides uh, in the audience. Okay, and this also creates this bond, uh, this connection between the characters and the audience. We can say now that the audience are not separated from the dramatic performance. The audience now are part of the dramatic performance uh, uh, because of this bond that is created. And this bond is uh, facilitated by the structure of the, uh, of the theater itself as well as the dramatic, um, uh, the dramatic techniques that... Um, uh, that are um, intervened by the playwrights. Now, before we go into the lighting in the 18th century theater, now I would like to give you two examples on uh, solace and asides. Um, you remember from scene two of act one, we have Tony Lampkin. He steps forwards to reveal that the reason uh, behind his setup 
and behind uh, him deceiving Marlowe and Hastings into believing that this is not Mr. Hardcastle's mansion, but actually it is an inn, is because he wants to avenge his stepfather's abuse of him. Um, without this uh, dramatic technique and without the, facili uh, the uh, uh, facilitation of the theater uh, to do that, we wouldn't be able to uh, know the, the, uh, the hidden motive or the tacit motive of, um, uh, of Tony Lampkin's uh, device. Now, if we take an example of a site, we have um, uh, in today's uh, lecture, we, we are going to see that um, Mr. Hardcastle is having a conversation with, with Marlowe and Hastings, and he really start, starts to feel um, uncomfortable with the way Mar Marlowe uh, behaving himself around Mr. Hardcastle. So he has a, um, a judgment. Okay, um, all of a sudden, Mr. Hardcastle is judgmental now, and he directs his judgment of Marlowe to the audience, saying uh, that he looks like an impudent young man. Now, before we go into the lighting uh, of theater in the 18th century, I also want to say that um, uh, the presence of the fourth stage uh, that creates uh, this closeness, this intimacy between uh, the stage or between the characters and the auditorium helped with what? Helped with the, with the uh, recitation of the prologues and the epilogues. Why do we have epilogues and, uh, and prologues? Because um, the, the actors want, the actors and the characters want to to win uh, the audience's approval of the play or favor the audience's favor of the play. So what do they do? They recite a prologue and then at the end of it, uh, they hoped that they had uh, gained uh, the audience's favor, so they recite their epilogue. So um, the presence of this forest stage um, helps with that. Now, let's go to the lighting in the 18th century theater because th this was a striking feature or it is a striking feature for us. Um, most of the plays in the 18th century had to be performed indoors because of this. Um, because um, unlike um, nowadays uh, theater in which only the, the stage is lit uh, uh, and the audiences um, uh, and the, the auditorium uh, is dark. At that time, um, they had both the stage and the auditorium lit by candles and oil lamps. They didn't ha have the uh, the luxury to uh, to uh, to spot to spotlight only the stage. Okay, so that pressurized the, the playwrights to only perform their uh, their uh, plays indoors, uh, and this has uh, a pros and cons because, uh, from one hand, it made it um, look really realistic to have an indoor performance, but at the same time, uh, it was uh, difficult for the creation of. Uh, uh, or difficult for the performance of outdoor uh, of outdoor uh, uh, scenes. Uh, for instance, here in Shistupsukanka, we have in Act Four or maybe Five. Um, uh, Tony Lampkin deceives his mother into believing that she is far away from her house, whereas she is still in her garden. Uh, but now we uh, or they made. Uh, uh, advantage from the uh, the stage darkness from one side of the stage to give the impression that she believes she is um, outside whereas she actually in her garden <laughs> 